Hi, I'm Doug Betts. Welcome to my new YouTube channel, Live Windows Training. This is where I provide professional computer consultant services to people on YouTube for almost free. I've been a computer consultant, self-employed since 1992, serving my clients in the Fresno, California area. For my local clients, I provide phone support and remote connection support and on-site support. Through this channel, I'll be providing remote connection support and phone support. For people who need assistance with their computers, perhaps something's not working right, maybe even upgrades, and for teaching techniques that a person wants to learn about. So if you'd like to have a session with me, go to the website livewindowstraining.com to find out how to request a session. Today's session is what I call black level. I have three levels to the videos that I'm going to be doing and what I mean by black level is that the thumbnail for this, let's get to here. The thumbnail for this is, has black lettering in this area of the thumbnail. And that's for what I call uh, computer technicians, whether amateur or professional. So the content in this type of video will be uh, a little more intense. It'd be for people who are providing assistance to other people, not just fixing their own problems. They might be doing this amateur or professional. So professional computer technicians, I intend for the black level videos to be of interest to them. Now, by contrast, a green level video where there's green text in this area would be for end users. People who are using their computers to either for work or for personal use, and they just want to do their tasks, not really interested in learning how to fix problems. So that's going to be more focused on uh, how to use various features in Windows to make your uh, your work more productive. And then a blue level uh, video would be for advanced users. Might say intermediate or advanced users. This is, would be a person who wants to be able to fix more of their own problems with their own computer and not have to turn to some uh, company tech support or outside tech support or to a neighbor. They, they want to learn enough to be able to get by on their own. So today we're on this black level, difficult internet failure. What I'm going to do here is uh, describe a recent service that I provided by telephone and text and photos with a client. Now this is an actual paying client. So I'm going to be blurring out various screens that we get to and protect her identity. When people are uh, requesting sessions with me through YouTube, uh, there's not going to be quite so much an anonymity. I want to be able to show the real experience so that the viewers can actually see the interactions with uh, the person that I'm assisting. So let's go ahead and get into this. I'm going to bring up the uh, pictures that I have on the second computer here. So this was one of the first uh, pictures that she sent me indicating the trouble. And what she told me was that she's unable to get uh, to the Internet and that a technician from AT&T She'd already spent a lot of time with a technician from AT&T over the phone, and she had also spent a lot of time with her technician from her job. Well, this is March 31st today, so this, this um, service was last Saturday. Today is Tuesday, so what, three, three, four days ago? And she had been instructed by her 
employer to work from home. Her employer is a fairly large organization, and they have their own uh, full-time IT support. I'm not sure if they have an IT department or if it's just one person. Not really important. But she's required to work from home, so having functioning Internet was important. She explained to me at the beginning of this service that it all started because she had a beeping noise coming from her equipment closet or cabinet. It's more of a cabinet than a closet in her home. And to her perception, the equipment in this cabinet was for her AT&T internet connection. So she called AT&T and told them about this beeping. The technician on the phone, now I'm paraphrasing a little bit and recollecting, so I'll, I'll make the disclaimer that I didn't record the conversation, I didn't write, take notes, so I may have some of the details a little mixed up from what they were, but the actual significance of this troubleshooting experience will be totally relevant. So she told the technician that about this beeping noise. The technician said, just a minute, let me check on your equipment. He checked on the equipment and he came back on the phone and said, ma'am, your, your equipment is very, very old. We need to replace it. Yes, it is uh, the, the source of your trouble or probably the source of your trouble. Not sure that he was actually affirming that the beeping noise was coming from the router. But he said, it's an old router. We need to replace it. Well, it's about 10 years old. It was new when she bought the house. The house was new when she bought it. So they, they either shipped her a new router or maybe a technician delivered it. Not sure about that, but it was a self-install kit. I think it was probably shipped to her. She took the, the, opened up the kit, looked at the instructions, it looked pretty simple. She moved the wires from the old router to the new router. She told me the instructions didn't exactly match what was on the new router, um, but it, it, it seemed to be right. Uh, it was all color-coded and made sense to her. But when she tried to get to the internet on her computer, this is what she was faced with. Now, the next uh, picture I need to blur a little bit, and I'm doing, the, I'm doing this blurring um, live because when I'm working with YouTube um, participants with their real symptoms, I want to be able to blur things before showing them to the internet at large. So there's going to be little pauses here while I'm focusing my attention on blurring operations. And that'll do it. So this is a record of our one of our first uh, phone calls. And she had uh, texted me with the trouble. Uh, well, she called me. Yeah, this one here, 11.40 a.m. She called me. We spent seven minutes on the phone. And... Then I called her back a while later because I wasn't at my desk at the time. So there was an, a one-hour uh, call, and I've blurred out her phone numbers and her address and her name. 
Then we'll go to the next We'll go to the next screen and it is already properly blurred. Because I did this blurring in a way that's going to take care of a few of the photos here. And so now here we had, well, this is the one hour and seven minutes. Let's go on to the next one. This one is an incoming call, 29 seconds. I believe at that point I had asked her to try to do a FaceTime call to me. And that didn't turn out to work for us. I think she was on an Android phone. And then the next one, one hour and 59 minutes. So this was almost two hours. So you can see over three hours that we spent on resolving this. We did resolve it, and we had some side tracks, some, some diversions on subjects that weren't directly pertaining to the internet connection, but rather some other equipment that she had. Then let's get to the next one, and we don't need any more any blurring anymore, so let's turn that off. So she explained to me that when she replaced the router, she was still she still had the beeping going on. And she noticed at that time in this same closet where the router is, is up high or it's above this area, she noticed this red light and says replace battery. And she realized at that point that whatever this piece of equipment is, it was the source of the beeping noise. It was, the beeping noise was not coming from her router. Let's go on to the next I asked her for a larger view of the entire cabinet. And this is the router up here. You can see the AT&T logo in one of their labels. And she had made a point that when she was uh, either talking to the technician on the phone or if it was somebody that delivered, she was told to use the same the power cord that came with the new router to not use the power cord that was there for the old router. So that had had made sense. And sh when she showed me this picture, she sh told me this was the router. And she told me that this box down here came with it also. And this looked to me like a box kind of leaning at, a, at an angle there. And it didn't, I didn't understand quite what that box was. So I asked her to give me a better view of what that box is. And here's a close-up picture of that box. And as soon as I saw this area, I realized, oh, it's a power brick. I just didn't recognize it the way that it was sitting in this cabinet. In this cabinet, I was thinking this cabinet was like a full height closet uh, but but it's it's much smaller than that because that's actually a power brick right there. I was had the impression that that was a larger device than a normal power brick, but that's what it is. It plugs into the electrical outlet on the wall and converts the incoming 110 volt electricity to a 12 volt output. So it sends out a 12 volt DC power to the router. Then this other device that was in the cabinet, you can see the beige coloring here that we saw on a previous photo. I was wondering what is this device? There is one cord coming from it that goes to the power. And there is this wire that go that curls around the back here and then runs up the side channel to a hole in the ceiling and goes out into the ceiling with a, a bundle of other wires. And here she was just holding that wire out because I didn't at first see it. 
uh, stuck in the back of that uh, channel there. And then I had her take some pictures of this uh, label. Now this is all kind of a sidetrack to the router issue because I'm just questioning what is this device? Um, a little bit intrigued by it, I guess I'll say. So this part number and this number over here, I did a Google search for those two numbers and they came up together on uh, for several search results and it turned out to be a Alcatel phone uh, system product. So it appeared to have something to do with her phone. So when I told her that and with the idea of a battery, she pitched that she thought it was a battery backup for her landline phone system. Now back in the day when I actually had a landline phone system of myself, we didn't have a battery backup. Phone Analog phones just worked straight off of the phone wire coming into the house. They didn't need any power. So apparently landline phones, more recent than my experience, do have a battery backup in some instances. So now we turn our attention back to the internet. I had her power cycle the router by unplugging it from power and then reconnecting it and then open a browser. And this is one of the messages, one of the screens that come up. Uh, I'm not quite sure if this was the first screen that came up, but she got this connect to network. The network you are using may require you to visit its login page. So when I read that, I was thinking, well, let's, okay, this could be a new AT&T router. Maybe you have to go to their website to somehow authenticate the new uh, router. So that kind of made sense. So I asked her to click on the connect button. And then she got this message, this site is not secure. Well, on this one, now I think this is actually the first thing that, that the first picture that came up. I think I got these pictures backwards because I think this was trying to come up with her default home page. This site is not secure. This might mean someone's trying to fool you or steal any info you send to the server. You should close the site immediately. Well, this made me think that perhaps it was her home page, however the URL is configured. Not entirely sure that we're seeing an accurate representation of it in that address bar that could have been redirected to that. Um, I'm thinking that maybe the new router has some higher level security that somehow the URL for her web page didn't have right. That was a foreign idea to me. I have not come across that before. So I was kind of grasping there. What could that mean? And I know when you click on more information, sometimes we get a opportunity to go to this site anyway. That's commonplace when trying to log on to the configuration screen of a router. So that kind of sounded possible. So then we get to uh, this page, AT&T U-verse gateway authentication failure. Please contact your service provider. Well, the service provider is AT&T. She's already contacted them and they failed to solve the problem. This is really looking like to me like it's something on AT&T's side that they need to reset their system to allow for a new piece of hardware to establish this connection. Now the next picture I need to do some blurring for. So let's switch cameras around a little bit. And how many blurs do I need to do? Let's do one, two, looks like two. Should do it. Pull up a blur two template. There we go. 
So here's the next screen, and we get the AT&T verse and I'm just realizing now that this home services setting sitemap, this is that same tab layout that we're gonna see on another screen that has to do with password setting. So, so notice that home services setting sitemap, we're gonna see that again in a little bit. But this shows us there's, a, there's an option for troubleshooting. We did go through that. That did not solve the problem. There is a restart your system. We tried that, did not solve the problem. There is a restart for the connection to AT&T. And this was the biggest uh, answer that we had up to this point, was that this is saying the connection to AT&T was down. So it's not connecting to AT&T, but we are connected from the computer to the router. So that's good to know. Here we have a SSID for her Wi-Fi and the network key. And I have those items blurred out. And then we have a status of on. This on is for the wireless is on. But the connection to AT&T, otherwise referred to as a WAN or wide area network, is down. The VoIP for voice over IP, we're seeing here there's no subscribed service. Now, this supports the idea that we know she has a home a landline phone system, but it's not going through this AT&T router like it would normally do for, for VoIP. She has a landline phone system that's used, that apparently is using that other uh, white or beige device that we looked at. And then down here, I uh, blurred out the, uh, the information under the home network devices. There are two devices in that section. The first one you can't tell, but it shows as inactive. And the second one shows as active. And that has the name of her computer. Oh, no, you do see inactive, inactive. What you don't see, what I've blurred out, is the names of those devices. So this is what the AT&T router is showing us. Now let's go on to the next one. This is, I asked her to give me a picture of the router. By the time we got to this point, she had already described to me what she's seeing on the router. And what she has is a solid uh, green light for Ethernet and a solid green light for broadband. Now, when she told me that, I thought, well, that sounds good. That sounds normal. Sounds like we are connected to AT&T. But when I saw this, I thought, well, no, maybe not. It looks like there should be a light next to service. I asked her to look real closely to the right of the word service to see if there is one of those square shapes like the other two green squares that she sees. Is there another square there that's just simply not lit right now? So she turned the router and looked at it and used, I think she said, a magnifying glass. They, the, the panels on these LEDs, they're really hard to see. She wound up concluding that, yes, indeed, there was one of those squares there and it was not lit. While she was looking for that, I took this model number down here and Googled it. And I found that, yes, indeed, there is supposed to be a green service light, and it's supposed to be lit. So this supports the idea that we don't have service through the connection. This broadband light indicates to me, I think, what sometimes is called a link, meaning this router actually sees the wire out there, sees something to communicate with, but it's not actually making the communication. This supports the idea that I've, that I've had that AT&T needs to do something on their end in order to allow this router to connect. 
See, they have safeguards in place so that you can't take a router from one address or home and take it to some other home where you're not actually paying for service and plug it in and get service. So, yeah, I've got a pretty good idea. That's what's going on at this point. And that's all handled by MAC address, a hardware address that's assigned unique to this device. Let's take a look at the next picture. I asked her for a picture from the back of her computer where all the wires are connected. We can see a VGA cable here. This looks like it's likely an Ethernet cable for the network cable and these other co cables I'm not too concerned about there's a USB cable this one's probably a USB cable this one may also be a USB cable so I asked her I, I, I told her you have a manila or white cable connected to the back of the computer I need a better picture of where that actually connects to the computer. So I asked her to do that and send it to me and here's what she sent. Well, now we can see that these other three are indeed USB cables, but I was really distracted and happy to see this light where the ethernet cable was connected and that confirms we do have a network connection. Now, at this point I'd already seen the uh, status screen from the router. So that pretty well substantiated that we have a connection. But I like to confirm things and be thorough. So this is part of being thorough. The next part of being thorough is I asked her to go over to the router and disconnect. Yeah, I don't have a picture of that. I asked her to disconnect the cable from the Ethernet port on the uh, router. I know I do have it up there. Let's, yeah, we're not going to get to that for a little while. So she disconnected that and this light went off. That's, I wanted to see that because there could be some other network switch between the computer and the router. It's unlikely. She lives alone. She bought the house new. She only has one computer. Um, so it was unlikely there was a network switch somewhere else, but I wanted to confirm that, and that confirmed it. We unplugged that Ethernet cable from the router. This light went off. If there's a network switch in between, this light would still be on because that network switch would be providing power, and, and it, it would be a connection. So that was just another piece of information. Now here's that same AT&T screen with the home tab, services, settings, sitemap. Now I think she had taken this picture prior to our phone conversation because she told me she was forced to change the password. And she, oh yes, she was working on this with her office IT support. He was telling her that she needed to type in her AT&T password. And she had found an AT&T password that she had in the past. They tried a number of things here and were unsuccessful. And I think at some point during my work with her, she did get back to this. And I told her, just close this window. Um, somehow we got past this point. I'm not sure if we actually were faced with this or not, but we did not change her password. I did have her at some point enter the password that's on a label on the router, but this looks like it's for resetting the password. Not quite sure what was going on here, but it was just part of the process. So I let go of that and we went on to the next uh, step. And what I asked her for was to take pictures of all the labels that are on the router. And this one is just telling us about the power adapter. Now, that was kind of interesting because AT&T had stressed to her that she needs to use the power uh, cord that comes with the new router. Don't use the one with the old router. 
But this part here where it's saying if you're using UVerse with voice, which she isn't, that she's supposed to use a Belkin battery backup. She's not using that. Uh, this is this device is not plugged into a battery backup. It's plugged straight into the wall outlet. All other members, which should be her, is only supposed to use the model number such and such AC adapter. She is using an AC adapter, the one that came with the device, but it's not this model number. So that's a little disconcerting. I really didn't think that had anything to do with our issue. But it's just a matter of AT&T sending out instructions that are not valid, not right. Okay, the next picture, I know I need to do some blurring, so I'm going to switch to my other camera and then take a look at the next picture. And I need one blur on this. So I'll call up that blur. I'm just going to check on audio. I'm just going to check on audio. That's working. And let's get that blur in there. All right, so I had to edit out a little bit here because I accidentally didn't do the blurring right. And this is probably a moment to explain that when I'm doing the live streams, I will not have the DVR mode turned on. DVR mode during a live stream means you can back up the live stream to relook, review a, a piece of it. It's like pressing a rewind button. I will not have that active when I'm doing a live stream with a, a guest. Uh, with, with someone that I'm helping because if I make a mistake, I want to be able to edit that out and prevent somebody from going back to take a second look at whatever it, it whatever the mistake was. And it's not a matter of hiding my mistakes. It's high, a matter of hiding uh, personally identifiable information for the person that I'm working with. So that's the, the best safeguard I can think of to, to implement with doing this during live streams. So now uh, let's see if we can take that down a bit. So what I've uh, blocked out here is the Wi-Fi name for her Wi-Fi and the uh, Wi-Fi password. It's uh, significantly longer than what I am showing there. So the only reason for blocking this out, blacking this out would be the worst case scenario, what a person could do if they figured out where this client lives, they'd have to go park, park in front of her house and then try to steal Wi-Fi service from her. That hardly makes sense that that would even happen. But on the lines of being uh, what more cautious than probably necessary, I will be safeguarding that type of information for people. So now let's look at this. Uh, that's just one of the labels that was on there. And that wasn't going to be very helpful for us because we weren't really trying to deal with the Wi-Fi situation. So now the next picture also needs to be blurred out. And that's going to need, let's see, one, two, three blurs. And there we go. So this label had more information for us, a serial number, part number, MAC address. This MAC address, which is a hexadecimal address, is the address that the AT&T system would use to recognize this router. So uh, commonplace when you put in a new router, the internet service you're using, 
wide area network would recognize the MAC address of your router. And if you replace the router, you might need to contact them to let them know that so they can reset and detect the new router. But um, the installation instructions did not tell her that she had to call them for that. And this device was sent out specifically for her. So that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. We have the SSID for the Wi-Fi, and I've just blocked out the three digits of the Wi-Fi address, a wireless network key. I blocked that out. For advanced configuration, this just gives the IP address of the router, and that's totally irrelevant and not useful to anybody. And then the device access code. This is the password for accessing the router and making any changes to it. So this is her AT&T password. And the tech support that she was using from her office did not, he, he said that, no, this is not it. He did not accept this. And I'd have to say that's probably because he's a corporate IT and not used to what's on these devices for the home environment. Now, the next... Um, the next uh, window needs some uh, blurring, too. The next picture needs some blurring. Let's see what that is. Oh, yes. And this will be one blur. And that'll do it. Here's uh, screenshots of our text messaging chats. And so this shows how the photos come to me during this type of a support call. So I'm doing this all of, all of this off of my cell phone working with her. So I've blocked out her name up here and I'm uh, this is me in the green asking her to open the internet browser and show me a picture of what you get. Uh, so this is early in our communications. Not sure what you mean when I click on Internet Explorer, Google website comes up. But when I try to connect to something, this is what I get. So here's what she's saying is when she launches Internet Explorer, she would get the Google search page. And it looks at that point, it, it appears that she's connected to the Internet. But when she tries to click to anywhere else, she would get this message. And I showed you a better shot of this uh, picture before where it says connect to network, the network you are Using may require you to uh, visit the login or visit its login page. And then the site cannot be reached message. And then down here, she's saying, OK, I said that all wrong. That continues on the next picture. Here we go. OK, I said that all wrong. When I click on Internet Explorer, this is what I get. So now she's saying, when she launches Internet Explorer, this is the first thing she gets, not the Google page. This site is not secure. And then a gateway authentication failure. And then uh, through more futzing around, and I'm not quite sure what the sequence was that we did, but these there's a little bit of a time gap between these two pictures. We got to this page for that that shows the status of the router that showed that it is down that the connection to AT&T is down then let's go on to the next one and she okay at this point there's a time gap here where I had been guiding her through some things with the router I had asked her to uh, restart the router. We tried the reset button on the router. And then we got to a point where I said, okay, I want you to disconnect the power from the router and disconnect the broadband cable from the router and leave it all disconnected for at least 15 minutes. Maybe we'll go longer than that. And uh I'm going to look up some information on my end, and we're going to hang up the phone call, I told her. And, and uh, I told her while she's got the router disconnected, call AT&T. 
when you call AT&T or Comcast from a phone number that they have on file or they're programmed into their computer that's for your account, when you call in from that phone number, they'll recognize where you're calling from. And, and if there is service problems in your area, they'll tell you that through the automated phone attendant. You won't have to speak to a technical support. So that's what I wanted her to do is call from the phone that she has that they know to be her phone. So realize she has a landline phone and a cell phone. So she called from the landline phone, even though that's not going through this router, because they have that phone number tied to her AT&T broadband account. So here she's telling me that she got connected with AT&T and was not disconnected, which that has happened before, or she's been on hold for a long time and, or even a short time and got disconnected because they're too busy. And there was no message about their system being down. However, the system did state that they were experiencing high call volumes. So my expectation is that I will be on hold for well over an hour. I'll go ahead and hold to see if they can help me. If they can't, I'll call you later. Because at this point in time, it's everything's pointing towards something on their end. And I replied to her, let's try a couple other things while you're holding. Reconnect the power to the router. Because keep in mind, this is the first time that we've gone 15 minutes with that router disconnected. I know some broadband services, if your router is disconnected for a long time, it can shift their equipment into a different mode to where they're looking or anticipating a new device. Let's try a couple other things while you're holding. Reconnect the power to the router and see if the service light comes on after a couple minutes. Then I'll give you the next step. She says, okay, I'll do that. But do you also want me to plug in the other cord that went to the red port hole, the red hole, or it was a port. And I responded with, um, yes. And then she replied a little bit later, oh my gosh, the service light is on. Now what? She sounds excited there, right? Well, I was excited too. I said, hang up and call me because I'm thinking now we are in business. And you can tell by the tone in my voice that we were not back in business. So the next picture is going to need some blurring. And let's see, it needs, and we've had this picture before, haven't we? It is too blurring. And I have moved those blurs. So let's fix that. So we're back to this <clears throat> picture. The connection to AT&T is down. Restart hasn't worked. And she said that the service light was on. So I said, go back to your computer and try to go to the internet and see if it works. And I was, I was totally expecting her to say, it's working. She didn't. So we got back to this page and it shows exactly the same situation we had before with the connection to AT&T is down. We tried restarting it, no joy. So I said, well, go back to the router and see if the service light is still on. She did so and found the service light indeed had turned off. And we were back at the state where we had, what was it, the power light on and the uh, uh, broadband light on, whatever, just the two lights. So we tried this uh, again, unplugged the, the router and plugged it back in and stayed there at the router and watched the um, sequence of the lights. And what we found is that that service light comes on for a little while and then it goes off. So it's like it's trying to establish the service and it fails. So that was totally a wild goose chase. Um, 
and just took us down the wrong path. Let's see what we got next. So then I asked her, well, give me a picture of the um, router. So here's the cables connected to the router. We've got the broadband cable. We've got two connect, uh, two ports here for broadband. One's labeled ONT and one's labeled DSL. And when I first saw that, I'm not quite sure what ONT is. Um, and I'm thinking, well, it's not DSL. AT&T is DSL, but they may have a technology newer than DSL that I'm not aware of. Of course, I know about fiber optic, but I'm not sure where AT&T is at in their progress with fiber optic. I don't have AT&T service in my own home. I have Comcast. And this is her Ethernet connection. And I thought that was odd that it just uses a couple twisted pair when the wire at her computer is a regular Ethernet cable. Well, it's probably connected to a wall outlet and it goes through the wall and somewhere along the line, somebody just put a RJ45 plug on this wire. So maybe it's actually, the, maybe the, the wire connecting to her computer was originally intended to be phone wire. No, I don't think that's quite phone wire. I'm not sure why that. Well, obviously, it's only a two-pair wire. It's not four-pair. Um, so anyway, that's the Ethernet. When she unplugged this, remember I told you earlier that the light went off on the computer. Now, out here, we have connection for the phone lines. Well, she doesn't have phone service through AT&T, so there's nothing connected there. And uh, up to this point, we had tried this uh, reset button. Now, that did not operate according to the manual that I looked up. The manual indicated holding down the power, the reset button for 30 seconds, the power light should go out after about 10 seconds and then uh, come back on. And I think it's supposed to come back on after you release the reset button. That's not what she found happened. She holds the reset button down and the power light just flickered uh, about 10 seconds out, but stayed on. Didn't really stay off for any significant amount of time. But we saw some other, there were some other lights uh, activity that made us think that it did actually perform a reset. So this was something that was always in question in my mind did we really get a proper reset to factory default settings? I was thinking maybe this router had been used in another home prior to it getting to my client's home. And maybe that was the source of our trouble. Maybe it had some configuration settings that at t service was not accepting as valid for this home. So that was kind of high on my mind. I, I was really, I was intrigued about this DSL port and the ONT port. This is clearly an RJ45 jack and it will not fit into this port. But I asked her to go ahead and try anyway. But I could tell, you can, you can tell real obviously just by this step right here compared to this step. Well, here there's, there's this level, this level, and this level. That's three levels. Here there's this level, this level, this level. There's four levels there. And that's an RJ11 jack. It's got six conductors where the RJ45 part, like you can see over here, has eight conductors. So there's no way this plug's going to fit into there. So that didn't seem like the source of our trouble. And we saw the broadband light came on, indicating it does see the AT&T equipment. But the service light comes on for a short period of time and goes off. 
So this sounds like maybe that's got something to do with it, but didn't seem like a strong likelihood. So then I said, well, what about the instructions that came with the router? I'm thinking maybe she's supposed to make a phone call. So I asked her to take a picture of each page of the instructions. And here's what, um, here's what she sent me. This part, uh, get started, downloads Smart Home Manager. Now she did not do any of this with att.com Smart Home Manager. Well, this seems to be for managing IoT devices. IoT stands for Internet of Things, such as if you have a, a control module for your air conditioning or to turn lights on and off, you can do that through Wi-Fi setup, and that's what you would want to do with a cell phone. She didn't do this, but... I didn't think that had anything to do with our problem. I, I read through this to see if there was anything on here about actually establishing, is it possible they require a cell phone to establish the service connection? That really seemed unlikely. There was nothing in that text indicating that. So the next page, it shows the wiring. So it shows the old router, also referred to as a gateway, and the new router or gateway. She had a red connector on her old router and she connected that to the red port on the new router. The new router has an ONT port and a DSL port, but there's nothing here labeled DS, DSL. Here's a port labeled broadband. Now that was troublesome. This port is labeled broadband, which that's that's an internet connection. That's wide area network. That's That made me think that this ONT is something else, some other kind of device that I'm unfamiliar with and that it doesn't have anything to do with broadband. But that doesn't make sense because the ONT port on the new router is in a section that's labeled broadband. It was labeled broadband, and then there was one port for DSL, one port for ONT. Then here's the Ethernet ports. She has one connected to her computer. The cable line she's not using. Phone line she's not using. So I read through this. The only thing of significance here is that Wait for 15 minutes before you power up the new gateway and complete the startup process. Well, there's nothing printed in these materials about what the startup process consists of. So let's see what the next page has to say, but I, it was noteworthy to me. There's nothing in here about calling AT&T to inform them that you have a new router connected. I wasn't expecting it to, but I wanted to be sure that it didn't have that. So now here's step two, using your Wi-Fi. Is this part of the, what what they say, startup? Yeah, startup process. So this step number two is using your Wi-Fi. Use your Wi-Fi settings will automatically transfer from your old gateway to the new one. Well, I thought that was interesting. What if this gateway had been used at somebody else's house? prior to coming to my client's house. She had not done anything with configuring Wi-Fi. Your wireless devices will connect to the gateway again when the process is complete. Open the smart home manager. Well, okay, so this is for the home smart home manager. She doesn't use that. Not interested. Since settings will not match the new gateway's defaults, Use the enclosed yellow sticker to update your Wi-Fi info and apply to the new gateway. So they got this sticker here. They're telling her to put that on her router, her gateway device, to show the new settings. Well, the settings that are on her router are all on printed labels, 
manufacture printed labels. It's not a peel off stick on label. So that kind of takes away from the idea that this was already configured in another house. Although they could have given her a new set of instructions. Next, return your old equipment. Well, that certainly wouldn't have anything to do with getting the new equipment working. It's telling us to bring the equipment to UPS or FedEx store, have a nine-digit account number handy. This is all about returning the old router. Now, notice here there's this, we need to receive your equipment within 21 days of your replacement order date to avoid non-return fees. At this point in the process, I'm asking myself, I wonder if she still has the old router. She might have, you know, very promptly returned it. Um, so let's see what's next. All right, so here... I asked her for a picture of, I asked her about the old router. This is the old router. So I asked her to show me a picture of the old router. And actually, when she has the old router, I said, well, plug it in. So she plugged it in. And this is where that RJ45 jack is plugged into a broadband port. It's not a ONT port. It's not labeled as a DSL port. So we really don't know what it is, but it's a 10-year-old router, and I'm thinking it's got to be a DSL port, because that's what AT&T is. Now, she doesn't have her computer plugged in yet. Let's see what's next. Here's a picture of the two routers stacked on top of one another to point out the differences. That broadband port, we said it was color-coded. The picture's a little blurry, I know that. It's color-coded red. Doesn't quite look like the same shade of red, but again, these were manufactured 10 years apart. Yeah, we don't know they were manufactured 10 years apart, but they're different model equipment. So it made sense that the red port of the old router should correspond to the red port of the new router. That just makes sense. But I still don't know what ONT is. Now let's see what's next. And is this picture connected to the old router? I think, yes, it was, this is what she got. I think I had, her, I had her then restart her computer since it's a different router. Not quite sure about this. Oh, wait a minute. This We're back at the beginning. Yeah, this is the last picture that I've got in the list of pictures. This This one here was what we started with. So this is the end. So now let me go on with the story. Since this works with the old router. My conclusion at this point, and I feel pretty confident about it, is that this is a DSL line. This wire needs to have an RJ11 jack put on it, and then it would work in this port. And I started explaining this to her, and it seems to me that your, your home has the wrong jack on here and that perhaps sometime in the past since you moved into this house, they may have done an upgrade in your neighborhood. Oh, I left, I haven't explained to you yet. I looked up this ONT on a browser. Let's see, I think I have that browser page even still open. Uh, yeah, here, I just went to Google and said, what is ONT? And down here, optical network terminal. Bingo, obviously, fiber optic. Optical fiber cable. That's what ONT is. It's for broadband internet with a fiber optic cable. And so I explained to her that I suspect somewhere back in the past, your neighborhood got a upgrade 
where everybody used to be on AT&T DSL, and they came through and wanted to upgrade your whole neighborhood to fiber optic, and somehow you didn't get that. And she says, oh, yeah, I remember that. There was a notice I received. They wanted to upgrade the equipment. And to do that, I was going to have to stay home from work during business hours. I didn't want to do that because there was, I had, I felt no need for this upgrade. I, she only has one computer. She lives alone. She has very light use of that computer. And upgrading to this faster internet service had no appeal to her whatsoever. So she declined. She refused the upgrade. So the technician never came into her house, and that technician, probably one of the tasks on that technician's to-do list was to replace this RJ45. Well, no, not do that. They would have been running a fiber optic cable into her home and replacing this, this old router with the newer designed router. Because remember, they were surprised when she was on the phone with them to find out that she had such an old router. And it was because she declined that upgrade back then. So with her remembering that situation where she turned down that upgrade, and from what I was able to piece together here, and then we found the old router works just fine, that was the conclusion, is that her service into her equipment closet is DSL. It's not fiber optic like the rest of the neighborhood had. So when she originally called AT&T, told them about the beeping sound, the technician on the phone looked up the information for her neighborhood, for her account, and saw that her entire neighborhood is fiber optic service and needs the new, that newer router and probably never would have occurred to him that she declined that service. Now, it might be in some records on her account, but a technician isn't going to go back and read all the prior notes that might be on an account to deal with a current loss of service. It doesn't make any sense to go back and look at old notes. So it was reasonable for the AT&T technician to think that the new router would fix her service. It actually broke her service. So I explained to her that she, her choices, she could move forward with getting the new fiber optic into her house, but it would have no benefit for her because she's a single use computer. She's not using AT&T for her television service. She's not using it for her landline phone. And she rarely even watches videos on her computer. Um, her, her TV service, I think she said it was off an antenna. Uses actually an, an old school antenna. So they did her conclusion then is no, she's not going to put in new equipment. Now, I am concerned, and I will probably uh, talk to her again about this. There could come a day in the future when AT&T decommissions the DSL service in her central office. Now, the central office is not the home office of AT&T. It's a neighborhood uh, equipment room or cabinet, and there must be equipment in there that's providing DSL service as well as the fiber optic service or different equipment, equipment for fiber optic, and I think it's different equipment for DSL. At some point, AT&T is probably going to want to decommission that equipment and take it out because they don't want to continue supporting it and maintaining it, whatever that means, whatever maintenance they might have to do for it. So when that occurs, they may not have any reason to realize that they need to contact her. Uh, maybe they will be able to check and see who is still getting service through there and contact her. But I'm 
concerned that someday she just may find her service broken again and have a difficult time tracking down why. So I at least want to tell her that that may happen in the future. And if it does happen in the future, she needs to tell somebody that she still has the old DSL service. And that will probably help solve the uh, lack of service at that time. So does that wrap up this story? I think so. I, my conclusion, it would have been very difficult for the AT&T technician to figure out what the source of the trouble was here. And I think it would have been very difficult for her IT staff at her office to be able to figure this out. I clearly would not have been able to figure it out without seeing the pictures um, or having her describe in enough detail. That would be difficult to do. And she wouldn't have known to describe this to me. It wasn't until I saw ONT next to DSL and realized that her new, her old modem did not have those same markings. So I've had many troubleshooting situations like this where it's a very abnormal problem. And I've seen correspondence in forums and Reddit uh, and, and various websites, tech support websites, where somebody asks a question and describes a situation, and I see them get kind of a canned response, a response that is uh, a common type of solution for situations that are somewhat similar to what the person's describing, but I can see enough in their description to see that nah, there's something else going on here. And if a technician could get a remote connection or pictures or they would probably be able to find a solution and that's part of what I'm wanting to do through this YouTube channel and the associated website both called Live Windows Training. The YouTube channels Live Windows Training hyphen Doug Betts no spaces in any of that. The website is livewindowstraining.com and so I invite people to uh, bring situations to me. If you see some kind of correspondence going on uh, through a forum or a tech support website and where they're just not getting to the right solution, man, I'd appreciate if you would suggest the person come get a session with me. Uh, the, 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 and the cost that's involved is so cheap, really, really cheap. I'm not going to say what it is on the video because it might change from time to time. So you got to go to the website to find out how to request a session and what dollar amounts are involved. And uh, I hope to hear from you. So we're going to wrap it up here. Have a great day. Catch you later. Bye.